Yeah, welcome back. This is part four of the local app video. Um, this is carrying on on the config tab uh, of how to program your classic with the local app. So at the sake of keeping this as short as I can, I'm going to jump right in. Assume you've watched all the other videos and we're going to go right to the advanced tab for part four. In the advanced tab, you're going to have things like auxiliary function and some of the other settings. The more advanced stuff that you may not normally use. So the, the goal here was if you're just setting up a solar controller you can run through the basic tab. If you're a little bit more advanced doing a little bit more functions with it you may up it in the advanced tab and then if you're really getting into the tweaks of it you'll be over in the tech tab. So on the auxiliary ones I'm not going to actually go into all the detail on all the auxiliary modes because they are in the, men, in the uh, manual that comes with the classic but just know that you can change all those different uh, modes here in my case I'm in diversion and over here we can decide whether we want that auxiliary to be off no matter what uh, on all the time no matter what or if we want it to be an auto where these settings down below will manipulate the status of auxiliary one as you can see mine is actually on and it's on because if you look at my parameters here the on volts is 51 the off volts is 49.5 and my battery is up around 52 volts so we're above the on stage and we've met the time criteria so it is turned on and again what the, basically what these mean here is the off volts when the battery drops down to 49.5 my auxiliary is going to turn off and then when the battery come, climbs back up and goes past 51 it's going to turn back on so those are your two you know trip points if you will the on trip point and the off trip point the delay time is how long it has to be at 49.5 in order to turn off and that's 0.1 second these are in one second intervals so that's 0.1 second and the hold time is how long it has to be there to uh, again, the hold time is there. It's uh, set for one second. The voltage would have to be at 51 volts for one second before it would turn the relay back on. We could turn that up to even a couple hours where the voltage would have to be above that, that voltage for that period of time before it will actually activate. So again, these are all just trip points and how long it has to be at that trip point before it does what it's supposed to do. Um, and depending on what mode you select, these boxes are going to vary based on that. Uh, aux 2 is the exact same thing. You select what you want aux 2 to do and you select whether you want it to be off no matter what, on all the time period, or auto control where the values down below will uh, will cause those to work. Uh, in aux 1 you are doing either a 12 volt signal out or a dry contact. Again, I won't go into a lot of detail. You can just do either one of those, and the manual that comes with your classic will explain to you how to set that up for either one of those. Aux 2 is going to be 12 volt out or input signal. There is no dry contact in Aux 2. Aux 2 is typically a PWM um, signal as well, which basically, in a nutshell, means that it's turning off and on really, really fast, you know, thousands of times a second. Uh, that's really good for resistive diversion. So if you, you know, if you're trying to do uh, a diversion load and use up your excess PV or wind power or whatever, you can do that into a, a water heating element or an air heating element, but you only want to use PWM diversion with a resistive load. You don't want to use it with anything like motors or air conditioners or something like that. So if you're unsure about that, you want to reach out to us and support and, and get a definition on what your load would be. But again, very elegant diversions as a, uh, as a waste not high, which what waste not high does is actually diverts anything not needed to charge that battery at the moment. Um, so if you're um, if you're in bulk, of course, you're using all the current you're, you have available to you from the PV array to get to the absorbed set point, so there is no excess. As soon as you hit that absorbed set point, there may be just a very little bit, maybe a half an amp of excess current, um, and this will, this will use just that half an amp to maintain that voltage. And then as the absorb time goes on, of course, the batteries become more full. That current, that excess current is going to rise and this will automatically adjust that and take all the excess and give it to the load but still maintain a full battery so it makes kind of a neat uh, a neat opportunity load if you will
And again, after you've made all your saving your your settings, you would save them by clicking the right button here. The next box we can configure is the limits menu. We have the output current limit of the controller, which by default will be at its maximum, which in the case of a uh, 150 on a 48 volt battery is 86 amps. Um, you can turn that down if you want to turn that down. Some sometimes you maybe uh, I'll say maybe you've got a smaller array, you've got a kilowatt of PV on a 48 volt battery and it can only do 20 amps typically so you use say 12 gauge wire and a 20 amp breaker you could set this to 20 so that if there was an edge of cloud event or something weird happened you wouldn't overcurrent the breaker and trip it so this is just a way to limit the output of the controller below the maximum if you will for whatever reason that may be typically you're not going to do that typically you're going to install a big enough breaker and big enough wire to use everything you have available to you at any given time but there are some instances where people will want to limit the output current uh, input current is going to be set for 99 by default and most generally is never ever changed if you have a reason to change the input current you will know why you want to change it uh, pretty much it's only going to be for something like fuel cells things like that where if you draw too much you can actually uh, oh, you know kill the uh, the energy production of the cell and have to be restarted or whatever so it, for the most part you're never going to change the input value it is just there if you have something interesting on the input that requires that the limits voltages just like they say, um, so typically with a charge controller or an inverter, you'll have a battery temperature sensor, and what it does is it compensates for the battery temperature. So when a battery is at 25 degrees C, we do zero compensation. We charge to what the manufacturer recommends. If the battery is colder than 25 C, we have to charge above the voltage the battery manufacturer recommends to properly charge it. And if the battery is warmer than 25C, we have to charge below what the battery manufacturer recommends. And the manufacturer will specify the windows for that. So say you've got a 48-volt a flooded battery. They may say, you know, don't ever charge above 62 volts. Um, so that's where you would set this here. And that is going to put a upper limit on the compensation for a cold battery. And this one is going to put a lower limit on the compensation for a hot battery. And again, those two values would come from your battery manufacturer. And once you had them set, again, you would commit them to the classic. Temperature compensation. This is what we just talked about. That uh, is the battery changes in temperature. We have to change its voltage to properly charge it. Typically, it's going to be negative 5, not 0.5, but negative 5 millivolts per degree C per cell. Um, basically, what that is saying is the millivolts is how much we adjust it one way or the other. The degree C is, you know, uh, so for every degree C above 25, we would move it, you know, negative 5 millivolts. And per cell, so this is this is down to a two volt cell level and this is how most manufacturers specify it so if you was to look at a trojan flooded battery for example their data sheet is going to say for temperature compensation use negative five millivolts per degree c per cell so if you had you know ten cells you're actually going negative fifty millivolts per degree c um, but the, the controller does all the math for you based on that nominal voltage that we set in the basic tab. And it knows that if you picked a 48 volt battery, you have 24 cells and it, it adjusts accordingly. If you have a battery manufacturer that tells you you need to compensate this battery 35 millivolts per degree C, and they've already done the cell math, then what you'd have to do is if it's a 48 volt battery, you divide it by 24 cells. If it's a 24 volt battery, you divide it by 12 cells. So if there's something non-standard here, you can either call your battery manufacturer and ask them to you know help you come up with this number and just let them know you need a number that is millivolts per degree C per cell or you can call us and we can help you get that too. The actual value will be supplied by the battery manufacturer though. Uh, the next value is the temperature, I call it the neutral point. This is the point at which no compensation happens. Below that we lower the voltage above, I mean uh, below that we elevate the voltage and above that in temperature we 
drop the voltage. This number is typically going to be 25 degrees C, but with some of the newer chemistries and, and stuff coming on the market, there are some battery manufacturers specifying something other than 25 C. So definitely check with them and make sure 25 C is correct. And if it's not, make that change here. Um, the other thing here that we didn't talk about is compensating for equalized voltage. And the reason that's adjustable is generally only applicable on 12 volt systems, but some lower cost inverters have a pretty low upper limit. So you may get a low cost 12 volt inverter that has a hard limit of 15 volts. And if you go to 15.1, it shuts down on high battery voltage. So this is put in there so that we don't compensate on the equalized voltage so that we don't go over those limits on that inverter. Again, check with your battery manufacturer and find out what they're going to recommend because if you are not compensating, you may not be doing a proper equalized charge. And if you have an inverter that's affected by that, you may actually have to disconnect the inverter while you do that equalized charge. So just things to be aware of on that front. So the battery status meter. This is if you have a Wizbang Junior installed, you're going to be able to program it to accurately give you a percentage of the state of charge of your battery. You know, it's going to say your battery is at 75% or 76%. Uh, typically, a battery meter that you may be familiar with uh, is standalone and it's going to be based on just time and voltage, so it doesn't know the actual temperature of the battery, so it actually can't compensate properly. It's basically just making a best guess. With the Wizbang Junior, because it knows the temperature of the battery, we can really fine tune right in on that. And why that's important is uh, just like the voltage needed to charge the battery changes with temperature, the actual size of the battery changes with temperature. So a typical lead acid battery will be, say, 100 amp hours at 25 degrees C. It's going to be more than 100 amp hours if we get the battery hot and it's going to be less than 100 amp hours if we get the battery cold and that value is set right here um, you would set it you know 1% per degree C is the most typical for most lead acid batteries again this is a value that your battery manufacturer would want to provide you as well as the efficiency it's defaulted to 94 percent you can adjust that up and down based on what your battery manufacturer tells you the battery is for efficiency um, so you'd want to set those two properly and then the capacity in amp hours based on the 20 amp hour rate of your battery typically it's going to be right on the label of the battery but it won't it might not be there and if it's not you want to reach out to your battery manufacturer and say what is the 20 amp hour rate the 20 hour rate of my battery in amp hours and they're going to give you a value and batteries in series stay the same batteries in parallel add so if you have say a golf cart battery that is 220 amp hours and you've got four of them in series for 24 volts you still have 220 amp hours at 24 volts if you added a second string of four now you would have 440 amp hours of battery. So it's it's the amp hour capacity of a battery times the number of strings you have in the uh, in the battery bank. The last one here is more for the uh, the techie type people. This is what happens to the USB jack on the classic. You can actually set it up to to do different things. Uh, you can set it up to dump logs every so often. You can set it up to dump the whole Modbus registers every so every couple seconds. You can disable anything coming out at uh, et cetera, et cetera. Again, those are pretty rare that anybody uses those. And if you if you know you want to use it, you probably already know what you want to set it to. And once you set it, you'd select this button over here. That brings us, uh, we're about 14 minutes into this, so I'm not going to go through the tech one in this video. Like I mentioned, we will come back with part five, and we will go through the tech tab. Thank you for watching part four, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in five.